I'm all set to talk about, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, organizations today are struggling with MLOps and how they can move from all the struggle to have a successful AI implementation, right? So uh, let me quickly bring up a few slides which I have, uh, right? So definitely I'm going to make it as interesting as possible, right, to help you understand what MLOps is because all these jargons can scare a lot of people, but trust me, uh, you know, these jargons will, will demystify them today, right? And of course, there's a takeaway for you. So there's some good things uh, which I'm giving out uh, today uh, at the end of the session. So please, uh, you know, hang on till the end, end of the hour. And uh, I will definitely try my best not to doze you off. I'll keep it uh, quite, uh, you know, engaging and interesting. And uh, yeah, keep keep putting those questions. We'll definitely answer all of them. Uh, I'll probably spend about 45 minutes going through the presentation. The good news is there's no hands-on today. Uh, there's no prerequisite. You just need to have the enthusiasm to learn about uh, data scientists. So uh, that's the quick, uh, uh, you know, a few minutes uh, about what will happen. So let me just do a quick intro of myself. So like Priya said, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of uh, my years helping organizations get value from IT and in the last seven years get value from AI, right? I've been instrumental in building a lot of AI programs for a lot of banks. And I felt that a lot of banks were struggling or a lot of enterprises were struggling to industrialize AI. And that's where, you know, we created Ketonic. Uh, and Ketonic is a machine learning operations platform which helps organizations scale AI. Uh, you know, uh, let's not, uh, it's not about Ketonic, it's about helping you understand MLOps. So let's quickly uh, get into the next slide. So, uh, you know, firstly, you know, uh, you know, I just want to, you know, I like this quote, right? So today's great companies, right, if you close your eyes and you can think of any of the great companies, all the great companies, you'll probably list them are all software companies, right? When I say software company, it doesn't mean they build software. But what it means is that they really use software into core, be it Tesla in the manufacturing, uh, be it, you know, mobile, be it, you know, iPhone. So every great company today is powered by software. I'm sure all of you agree. And I can tell you that in 10 years, every great company will be powered by machine learning or machine AI, right? And that's why AI is very important. And that's the reason, you know, sessions like this will help you understand AI so that you can help these great companies embrace AI, right? So with that, uh, you know, just want to spend a few minutes. Uh, look, AI uh, used to be kind of a good to have. It was, you know, innovation. A lot of people were looking at AI doing, you know, new things. But AI today has become mainstream, right? So every industry today uh, can benefit from AI. Some of them are benefiting from AI. And, uh, you know, there is a use case for every industry, be it banking, be it energy, uh, you know, be it consumer goods, right, or be it telco, right. And, uh, you know, organizations are benefiting and we also unknowingly use AI in our daily life, right, uh, be it while using a social media platform for facial recognition or be it, say, for example, the background here, it's AI, right. So uh, AI is going to be important and organizations have realized that and I'm sure, you know, a lot of you are here because you know for sure that AI is the future and organizations have increased their budgets, right? So people are spending more money on AI projects, data scientists, data engineers, machine learning engineers, business analysts who understand AI uh, are being hired, right? There's increase in the number of hiring and organizations will be spending hundreds and billion, hundreds of billions of dollars on products and services, right? So while AI, you know, is coming to the mainstream, organizations have realized that, you know, it is important for them. There's a bit of a disconnect between what the CXO level or the management thinks, right? And what's happening on the ground in terms of real capability. So this from a recent survey, you know, what came out is that only 6% of the executives feel that they don't have the right capability to implement or embrace AI, right? While 98% of them said AI is important. It was a bit of an irony. And uh, unfortunately, that's the situation. And even the organizations who have managed to implement, not, not Googles and Ubers of the world, I mean, they definitely have matured platforms, and that's the aim of Ketonic, to offer them those platforms. But even the ones, uh, the large organizations, large banks, telcos, who have implemented AI, they took too long to, you know, take AI models into production. It is too expensive to maintain, build, manage AI use cases, so only rich companies can do that, and only high-value use cases can do, right? Many low-value use cases and Tier 2, Tier 3, or even Tier 1 companies who can't afford millions of dollars are missing out on this opportunity, right? That's where, you know, MLOps comes in, and I'm going to talk about MLOps in a few minutes. But essentially, what's happening today on the ground, right? Why is it ML oops, right? Why are people, why are organizations failing in adopting AI? 
That's because, you know, these are the challenges they see. And I'll talk about why they are failing. But on the ground, you know, in any organization, if you hear this, the solution to their problem is ever loss. So you'll have, you know, people saying, look, I have a lot of data scientists. They build a lot of model. Nothing goes into production, right? A lot of data scientists build a lot of model. They give it to IT operations. IT operations takes forever. Our data scientists are waiting for three months to get a deep learning platform from our IT operations. And IT operations is still trying to figure out by the way, the open source platform or framework which they wanted, it's already outdated, right? So these are some of the problems or ground challenges you'll hear, which can only be solved by MLOps, right? So let's now talk about, you know, why organizations are struggling. I mean, these organizations are smart, right? They're not naive. They have spent billions of dollars doing digital transformation. So if they're, if they're, if they're struggling with AI, there should be some unique challenges which AI offers. So let me spend next few minutes talking about those challenges because it's important to understand the challenges, uh, otherwise you'll not understand the solution which is MLOps, right? And I'll deep dive into all those so challenges, how they're solved using MLOps, but let's talk about those challenges, right? So firstly, you know, there's a misconception uh, that AI or machine learning is all about model, right? Uh, there's so much of importance given to model, model learning, model development, and organizations think that, okay, in order to go uh, and, you know, start benefiting from AI, they should hire two or three data scientists. They should give them the data uh, and they, you know, build a use case. So let's say if you're looking at, you know, predicting a customer, uh, which customer will, you know, probably churn or, you know, uh, go away from your organization or not use your product, right? So your data is in your call center, on a call center, your data is in your emails, your data is probably in your CRM system. So you take a download of that, you give it to the data scientist, the data scientist will do a certain experimentation. And finally, you know, the data scientist will build a model and show it to the business. And business will be happy because the model is good. It will work. But when you try to productionize that model, the Jupyter Notebook or the VS Code or the R or whatever code the data scientist has written, it doesn't scale because Jupyter Notebooks or these ID environments are good for building models. You cannot scale, especially when it comes to petabyte of data, right? So what happens is, uh, you know, the offline data which you gave it to the data scientist, you need to have connectors to bring the data, you need to process the data, pre-process the data, you need to do feature engineering, and I'll talk about all this when we go uh, a little more detail, and you need to then train a model, you need to retrain a model, you need to take that model, convert that into an API, a scalable API, expose that, so there is so much more which goes on into taking a model into production, that model becomes only 5% of the total cost of the entire project, and because there was so much Importance given to the model, organizations underestimate the effort required to take a model into production. They don't have the right tools, and all these models become a museum piece. And I myself have been involved in delivering 30 to 40 of such museum pieces which are lying in many of the banks' innovation labs or maybe in GitHubs. The only way you can get value from AI is by taking a model into production and maintaining and managing that. And that's the only way you get value, otherwise you're throwing money into the dust. So that's the first challenge, uh, you know, the, the misunderstanding that model training is the end goal and the and, and the improper handoff. So even if you build a good model and you have the right tools, but if you don't hand it over to the right team who understands, it is still going to be a failure, right? So that's the first biggest problem which MLOps will be solving, and I'll talk about how it's done. Second problem is organizations' overconfidence on the tech investment they've made. So they say, look, we've invested millions of dollars on DevOps. Yes, they have invested millions of dollars on DevOps, right? But code is very different. So code is deterministic. So you give it an input, it gives you an output. So if I in install Windows 8 uh, operating system on Priya's laptop, it will work, and it will work for even five years, and you have mainframes working from 30 years, right? So code is deterministic, but AI is not deterministic. So AI is function of data and code. So when you build a model, there is a code you have identified, and you need to train that code using data. So if you have a facial recognition model created for Australia, it won't work in the US. You need to continuously retrain, even in Australia, you need to continuously retrain and you know uh, remodel. Otherwise, the model becomes stale and it will actually giving you start giving you negative business value. So there are a lot of case studies where organizations have built models and lost billions of dollars because those models go rogue, right? So AI depends on code and data. And also, you cannot manage AI with DevOps alone. You need more than DevOps. So you need continuous monitoring. You need to manage the data, the lineage between data and the code. And you also need continuous training. And that's what machine learning operations offer. So in a nutshell, MLOps is DevOps 
plus continuous monitoring and continuous training. If you don't understand all of this, don't worry, you get it by the end of the session. Yeah. So the third thing is AI is a game where everybody has to play together. So in the end, you know, uh, whatever technology you know you choose or any initiative you take, it's all about business. You are either saving money or bringing more revenue, or you're keeping the customers happy, or you're making employees happy. If you're not doing any of that, the technology means nothing. So businesses need to get involved. There are business matrices agreed, business benefits agreed. Then you need to come up with a hypothesis. You have data engineers giving you data. You have data scientists building models. Then you need to have machine learning engineers who convert that model into scalable pipeline. You need to then have DevOps to provision and maintain and manage this whole thing. So you need to essentially have everybody in the organization come together and good luck because most of the organizations struggle to collaborate because there is no, and on top of that, because it is so complex, there is no proper handoffs between these parties, right? Because each one today is using their own tool. So you have, you know, businesses using their dashboards, BI tools. You have data engineers using their own ETL data warehouse. You have data scientists sitting on a laptop, building a model on the, uh, you know, Jupyter notebook. You have machine learning engineers who have no clue how to convert the Jupyter notebook. So, so th that's the challenge, right? There are too many tools, uh, be it open or proprietary. And also the data scientists today, uh, I call them, you know, the way the kids today, right? Uh, my kids or anyone's kids, they are pampered. They're given everything in excess. So data scientists today are kids who are pampered because every day you have a new open source framework. You have a better framework. You have a better uh, open source tool which can help you. And data scientists want that because that will help the businesses get better. But software engineers and architects are process oriented. They are risk averse. They need to ensure that they scan every open source tools. They want to, uh, you know, look at the source code of every open source tools, scan it, and ensure that everything is, you know, all right before they give it to the data scientist. And that's where the friction comes in because data scientists are creative people and they want something quickly and process oriented people who are software engineers, uh, you know, uh, unknowingly become a bottleneck, right? And that's where AI requires all these tools coming together and these two different kind of parties coming together. And that's why it becomes a challenge. And that's again a challenge which can be solved by MLOps. So what's the solution? The solution is MLOps. So what is MLOps? MLOps is very simple, right? What DevOps did to software, you know, about five to six, I mean, 15 to 20 years back in 2000, 22 years now, didn't realize the time, is exactly what MLOps will do to AI, right? So you had your developers and operations sitting separately. It became DevOps. Now you have your machine learning development team, which is your data scientists, data engineers, sitting in, you know, building models, sitting in isolation, right? With operations, which is your IT operations, you need to bring them together and bringing them together doesn't mean, you know, bring them physically together. You need to give them the right tool. You need to give them the right processes. You need to empower them so that they can actually work together and deliver this uh, promise of continuous AI innovation where businesses can then identify use cases, experiment, fail fast, and the ones which are successful can be taken into production. That's MLOps. And I'll talk a little more about what it means from a data scientist and data engineer's perspective, right? And the next thing is, so this is how a MLOps platform looks. It's also an architecture diagram of uh, Ketonic. So, you know, you need to have platforms. So Ketonic is, uh, you know, it lives on Kubernetes. It installs on any infrastructure, be it AWS, be it Azure, be it on-prem. It is scalable. But more importantly, it gives the freedom and it caters to the creative, uh, you know, uh, scientific approach of data scientists. So we are not opinionated, 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 right? We are not, it's a tough one. We don't force data scientists or data engineers to follow a certain process. We give them the, uh, you know, freedom to choose ID environment of their choice. So any MLOps should, should give that uh, freedom. You get a freedom for ID environment of your choice. You get a freedom to uh, choose the algorithm of your choice. You get a freedom to use, you know, uh, you get the freedom to use Python to connect to your various data sources build apps on top of that. So the platform should cater to the end-to-end, -end, uh, you know, uh, MLOps from your, you know, experimentation, training, model development, deployment, monitoring, building apps on top of that. And also it should be role-based and proper handoffs. So we have taken the best practices from Google. So Google published a white paper. I'll share the link in the end. Uh, in uh, uh, August last year, we've taken those best practices incorporated. Now natively, you know, each user is actually, uh, you know, uh, doing a certain thing and incrementally you can take the particular use case and move them into production. And all this on a secure, we've secured it using Red Hat Keycloak. 
uh, it's an ISO 27001 company and all the right securities which is required because we have few deployments in the banks and banks just don't buy any software. So all that is there. So this is MLOps. Again, if you don't still understand, no worry, we'll, uh, we'll cover it in detail. So essentially, this is a platform where data scientists can experiment, hand it over to machine learning engineer who can build uh, uh, pipelines and put that model into production by converting that into an API. And then you have your operations team who's continuously monitoring that. And every time it deter uh, the, the performance of the mo uh, model deteriorates, you retrain. And it is on a scalable uh, platform. So we have uh, for organizations, there are like 20, 25 GPUs spun up in the night, videos being processed, and then we bring that back. So it's a flexible, gives you the uh, choice of, uh, uh, you know, your ID environment, and it's secure. And more importantly, not everybody is code uh, hours, right? So our, the platform uh, can, helps you move from co uh, no code to low code to full code, and you can, you know, move from one persona to another. So what does all that mean from an organization perspective, right? So from an organization perspective, what it means is that now customers can do more with less data scientists. Uh, you know, it's basically MLOps enables automation of a factory where with just three or four people, you can run this entire manufacturing factory, like what German machines do. Right? That's exactly what MLOps does. With very few, you can run hundreds and thousands of models without any manual intervention. And all you're doing is sitting and looking at those dashboards to ensure that everything is going all right and just get in when it's required. But what it also means is that, uh, you know, they are able to, organizations now are able to afford this platform because these platforms have been traditionally built by Googles of the world, Ubers of the world. Now it's affordable for them and that they'll be able to build many, many models and put them into production and have more control over your infrastructure. So with a platform on Kubernetes, which is scalable, you pay only when you use, and that gives a lot of benefit because uh, data scientists need, you know, high GPUs during training and you need stable, uh, you know, servers and environments during, uh, during model survey, right? So that's the benefit. I'll take a pause here. Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that, that gives you an end-to-end -end overview of, uh, you know, what are the challenges? What I'm going to do is uh, not a demo, but talk about what is the MLOps process. And today I'm going to cover level two process, level three process. And then finally, I'll point you to source some resources which will help you practice, understand. So let's uh, get into the demo, right? Let's understand what MLOps really means, right? So let's take a use case. Uh, let's take a real life scenario. Like I said, data science is all about solving problem, right? It's about making a difference to the business. So let's take an imaginary bank. It's called a data bank, right? And uh, so this is uh, our head of analytics, a data bank. And uh, our gentlemen spend millions of dollars implementing dashboards, BI. And unfortunately, uh, while dashboards are great, it only tells you what has happened, what, what has happened, right? It doesn't tell you what, what will happen. And uh, a lot of customers of the bank are leaving, right? They're churning and they have no clue what to do, right? And BI is not able to help. And that's where now they've decided to look at AI as a savior and look at using machine learning to predict why a particular customer or which customer might quit and also understand a little bit using the features why a customer is quitting and if there's anything which can be done. So this is the use case and I'm going to run you through how this use case is typically built and then how do you convert that into an MLOps level two and then I'll briefly introduce what is MLOps level three, right, which is the Nirvana state of MLOps. So firstly, you know, uh, in the, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of you might have the data science background, but for the ones who don't, let's talk about feature engineering because that's a word, word you'll hear again and again, uh, you know, when you're in the data science or the AI world, right? Feature engineering, you know, while it sounds a complex word, it's very simple. Uh, firstly, uh, the data in any organization is designed to be consumed by business applications. So organizations have marketing application, they have sales application, they probably have some other application, and each of these applications have database, and there is data sitting there, and that's how it was traditionally designed. The data is not designed for designed for machine learning. And so, when you need to predict which customer is churning, right? What you're essentially doing is you're taking each customer's data and using a machine learning model, giving it a score, saying what's the probability, because the AI will never tell you yes or no, right? It's just a probability probability game. It tells you this is the probability of something happening, and then you can decide what actions actions you want to take, right? So let's say in this case, we want to build a model which is predicting which customer might leave, right? And in order to predict a model, you need to train a model not using data, using features. And I'll talk about what features is. So let's say you're a real estate agent, right? And you are showing a house to your prospective leads. 
and uh, when you meet them, there is an intuitiveness within a salesperson or the real estate person or even in humans, right? Where, you know, you look at the person, if the person is come well-dressed, you know if the apartment is expensive, potentially he might buy because if he's well-dressed, he must be wealthy. Not always it's true, but, you know, usually that's the signal. Then what car is he driving? Did he come up, come with a family? Did he come on a weekday during office hours, which means he's serious because somebody who's not serious. not So these are nothing but signals, right, which help you intuitively understand if the customer will buy or not. Now, if you want to replicate this into a model, these signals are nothing but features. And these features are derived using data, which is unfortunately not in the format you want. So you need to do something called feature in detail. But essentially what you're doing is you're taking those data, converting that into signals or features, training a model, which is doing a certain prediction, that's exactly what feature engineering. Okay. So now let's talk about how do you build and how do you industrialize and what is MLOps. So firstly, the first step in uh, any uh, machine learning program is business objective. So in this case, the business objective is very clear. A lot of cases, the business objective is not clear. I strongly suggest that if you're into a team where you're building a model, please spend some time understanding why you're building that and try and understand what difference it is making to the business. Because only then you'll be able to figure out the right features and build a better model. That's my humble request to all of you, right? Second thing, uh, you know, the first uh, step in any AI project is a business problem and then a hypothesis that by uh, this model which we build will do a certain thing, right? So in this case, we want to build a model which will predict customer churn. So what typically organizations do, which is the right thing to do, is take the offline data. So you take a dump of your call center on a call center data, take a dump of your emails, the customer interactions, take a dump of your CRM and maybe three or four other, uh, maybe social media data if you have, or whatever data you have, and you give it to the data scientists. And data scientists are very smart. They'll take this data, convert this into features. And what you essentially, what essentially data scientists do in 2022, right, is not build algorithms. There are too many algorithms there, right? There's PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, a lot of algorithms already, nobody's building algorithms. What they do is they take the data, convert that into features, train algorithm one and see what's the prediction, train two, and then change the hyperparameter tweening. So it's an experimentation where you continuously trialing and erroring and ultimately, you know, you will find the best model which will do the prediction. And this is called experimentation and it is very important because sometimes you're doing multiple experiments, thousands of experiments, and you need to ensure that you're tracking those experiments. So experiment tracking is one of the important features of machine learning operations platforms. So that's something which should be there because it helps you, uh, you know, compare experiments, uh, you know, sort experiments based on matrices, identify the best experiment, and then take the particular model, which you then take it into production. So most of the organizations are fantastic at doing this, right? Because it's easy. All you need to do is you need to have a hypothesis. You need to hire a data scientist. You need to give them offline data. And after three weeks, you have a model, right? What, what they don't know which or what they struggle is the next step which is essentially taking this whole thing and productionizing. And that's what MLOps platforms help you do. So firstly, what you need to do is you need to convert this piece of code, which is in your Jupyter notebook or R, or in your, uh, you know, uh, whatever language you've written it in, whatever ID environment you use, you need to convert that into scalable pipelines. And scalable pipelines, because, uh, you know, when you're doing experimentation, you're playing with KB, MB, GB data. And in reality, in production, right, you have, uh, you know, uh, terabytes of data and you need to have a pipeline which can which can process that quickly and it needs to be serverless, which can scale the compute and it needs to be self-sufficient uh, and it needs to have all the dependencies, right? Now, that's the first step. You convert your notebook into a pipeline. Now, the offline data which you gave it to the data scientist, you need to now ensure that you can you connect to that either uh, if the customer has an ETL process who will then bring all those data into a warehouse and then that MLOps platform will then connect to that warehouse or even to the connectors directly and connect this pipe to the data source and rerun this pipe to recreate that model because the reason you want to you know build this pipe, I'll talk about uh, that. And now you have a model which needs to be put it into production, right? So the next step is to take this model and put that into production, which is nothing but putting that into a server, which converts into an API. And before that, what you need to do is you need to do model versioning. So tomorrow, if you get sued and if, uh, you know, you have to go back and reproduce why a certain inference happened, right? Why did you suggest certain thing to a certain customer? 
you should be able to reproduce. So you need to, and also, let's say you created a new version of the model, you realize, so just the way you can always, you know, go back to the older version of the code, you should be able to go back to the older version of the model. And DevOps doesn't do that. That's what, you know, uh, model versioning is, and that's what is offered through a capability called model registry, and that's what Ketonic platform offers through MLflow. So we've integrated Databricks MLflow into the platform, and like I said, it's a single UI. You really don't, uh, you know, realize that you're moving from one uh, tool to another. Uh, so model versioning is important, and now at a click of a button, or it could be whatever the MLOps platform offers, but as part of the process, you need to convert that into a, a API, and then you need to give that API uh, to your developers who will then integrate that into their web applications, in the mobile applications. But you can also build applications using, you know, uh, because what happens many a times is data scientists build an API, and during the experimentation phase after the API, if you take an API to the business, it doesn't make any sense to them. So you should be able to quickly build prototype using data apps like Streamlit, Dash, uh, right, uh, shiny, uh, and these help you really visualize the results, and you can even take them into production, right? So, Ketonic platform or the MLOps platform will help you build these apps so that business users or you are able to interact with these, uh, you know, uh, models. And the third thing is you also need to uh, infuse your, like in, in, in our case, you saw the head of data, uh, data analytics was upset because his Tableau dashboards or his Power BI dashboards or the whatever BI tools they have invested in. It needs to be now infused with AI. So you can have, you can write a pipe which will pull the data, run it against the model, and then go infuse AI or give you prediction in the dashboard. So your dashboards are now becoming from descriptive to prescriptive to predictive. Right? And this is just the first step. The second step is you need to continuously monitor the model, not just from a performance perspective. It's not just API and the storage uh, and the compute you're monitoring. You need to monitor against drift. You need to monitor against the accuracy, because the data keeps changing, and every time the data changes, the model, like I said in that diagram, might you know decay. You need to continuously monitor, so you need to have the MLOps platform give you that capability where you're continuously monitoring, and once you see any discrepancy or you see that the model is not performing, you trigger this pipeline, and now you understand why we converted that notebook into the pipeline, because you can trigger that pipe, rerun that pipe, and that pipe will, again, do, this, do all the things that the data scientists did, it will take the data, create features, run it against every algorithm, find the best algorithm, find the best model, and auto-deploy that into production. Versioning is taken care, completely automated, right? So this is MLOps for you guys. The good news is this is just level two. There's still more complexity to it, which I'll talk about level three, right? So uh, I think this gives you a good understanding of what MLOps is. So MLOps is nothing but... Uh, you know, uh, automating your end-to-end -end data science process, which is your data ingestion, featureization, uh, training, uh, retraining, monitoring, everything, right? That's what is MLOps. So let's talk about uh, MLOps level two, right? Uh, this is level two, sorry. Let's talk about level three, which is the Nirvana state, right? And uh, that is something which was published by Google as well in August, and I'll, I'll simplify that for you guys, and in the end, bring up that Google's famous picture, which is the level three, MLOps. So uh, now let's say, you know, uh, you successfully implemented MLOps, right, and you have a model. But in reality, it won't be one model, right? Trust me, in any organization, there are hundreds of, there will be hundreds of models, uh, like I said, in a few years. And you will have many, many thousands of pipelines running concurrently, right? And every time there is a new use case, data scientists will be creating a new model, new pipeline, the feature engineering will happen, all that will happen. Now, unfortunately, in any organization, the data remains the same, right? And the feature engineering, more or less, you know, because the data is the same, the use cases are similar, every time doing feature engineering again and again is a waste of time. It's a, you know, it's a lost energy uh, because you are repetitively doing it. And again, there is no consistency because in one use case, you might use a certain technique. In another use case, you might use a certain technique, and which is waste of time, right? And... Uh, most organizations, uh, you know, do, uh, don't have any reuse of features because they're not reusing that. And the second thing about feature engineering, which is annoying, is, uh, you know, uh, when you uh, when you write a pipeline which takes your raw data and it creates the feature and creates a model and converts that model into API, you need to do featureization before you call the API. So you can actually, you know, uh, put the featureization along with the model, but which is not practically most most of the time possible. So you are usually doing featureization before you call the API, 
and you need to ensure that that featureization, which is nothing but computation of conversion of that raw data into signals, needs to be equivalent. Otherwise, you end up having online offline skew, right? And this is where, uh, you know, uh, Vemelov's advanced technique, which is feature store, comes in. And Ketoni comes with an inbuilt feature store where we help you, you know, uh, identify uh, features and register them so that the data scientists can reuse them again and again. And more importantly, what we also do is we decouple this entire feature engineering process from your training and uh, inference process. So you can think of every time there is a new uh, project, you can go and look at feature store and look at features which you can reuse. And if you think that there is a new feature required, you will then probably build, a, uh, enhance that pipe so that the new feature can be created. And then you will dig into the feature store. And this is how most of the data scientists will be working. You will not, I mean, in few years, you will not no more be connecting to data warehouse or data source. Every organization will have a feature store, just the way they have database, where all the features will be stored. And as a data scientist, you will be building use cases from that. And this is level three. And the other advantage is, adv advantage of having feature store is you can eliminate that featureization before you call the API, because that is taken care of by the feature store. And that, you know, really brings in a lot of reuse from a feature perspective, takes away a lot of pain area of retrofitting the, uh, the featureization code, which potentially might be in hundreds of applications, right? And it will also bring a lot of reusability because you're doing feature engineering pipeline is, a, you know, something which will run separately. So it also helps you save compute. And so if I just uh, now bring everything together, this is the Nirvana state, and this is something which was, uh, you know, published by uh, Google, uh, you know, a few months back. So if I just uh, reiterate, so number one is you need to connect, you need to do ETL, you need to bring all the data into a data warehouse. And from the data warehouse, you have feature engineering pipelines, which will compute or process that data, convert that into features, put that into feature store, and that feature engineering pipeline is running on a regular basis. And on the training side uh, or on the experiment side, uh, uh, you know, data scientists are experimenting, and once the experimentation is complete, that is converted into an experiment pipeline, which will continue to do multiple experiments every time you want to do. And then you convert, uh, you know, you have your automated pipeline, which can retrain, if you remember I talked about, all and all the model versioning is happening in the model uh, registry. Performance monitoring is happen, And then you have this end-to-end -end machine, which can do millions, uh, you know, uh, which can process millions of features, which can, you know, process hundreds and thousands of pipeline. And, uh, you know, because it is on Kubernetes and powered by uh, Qflow pipeline or whatever pipeline, scalable pipeline, you know, it can. So this is the Nirvana state, and this is exactly, uh, you know, what organizations uh, will achieve in a few years. Uh, I just want to point you through to some of the, uh, you know, things. So, so firstly, you know, uh, I strongly suggest that you read this uh, practitioner's guide to MLOps. A great read, just eight or ten pages, uh, lots to learn from there. In fact, a lot of those best practices have been incorporated into a, a ketonic platform. If you are, uh, you know, looking at do, being an MLOps practitioner, you should definitely look at that. Second thing is, uh, if you can't wait for the next session to happen, just go to docs.ketonic.ai. We have a step-by-step -step for level two. We have a step-by-step -step process for level three with all the code for you. And also, uh, you know, we have a lot of pre-built accelerators on ketonic platform where you can see hundreds of use cases for banking, insurance, you can go take those templates, convert them into pipeline. And of course, you will ask me, Prem, where do I do that? We offer a free individual account on ketonic.ai where you can just sign up and then you can do all these things. And when we have the next session, you can probably follow, uh, you know, uh, you'll be able to follow more.